All right, turn with me, please, if you will, with me to Romans chapter 11. Romans chapter 11. We continue our series of messages from the book of, of Romans, and we've entitled it, What We Believe and How We Behave. And uh, there are three things that we answered the question about what we believe was in chapters 1 through 3 of the book of Romans, we ask the question, is the world really lost in sin? And then from chapters 4 all the way up to chapter 8, we answered the question, yes, the world is lost, but then the question comes up, how in the world can people be saved? How can we ungodly come to know Christ in chapters 4 through 8? And it seems like we get a pause in chapter 9, but really, in chapter 9, uh, the question comes up in 9, 10, and 11, whatever happened to Israel? Well, there are many who believe that Israel has uh, uh, been replaced by the church, and uh, they call themselves re replacement theology, that's what it's called, or covenant the the uh, theology, which means that all of the promises that God made to the nation of Israel in the Old Testament have been nullified by their rejection of Christ, and all of these promises are for the church. Now, these are this, and it's a growing group of people that are believing uh, this at this time. But we who interpret the Bible literally feel that God is made a covenant and made covenants, at least three unconditional covenants to the nation of Israel uh, that were uh, not uh, nullified. They're unconditional. And then in the New Testament, God made an unconditional covenant with both Jew and Gentile. And that unconditional covenant is recorded in John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That is an unconditional covenant. God paid, God's Son paid the penalty for our sin, and that God did not do away with Israel, and the Apostle Paul deals with this in chapters 10, 9, 10, and 11. In chapter 9, he deals with Israel's past. In chapters 10, he deals with God, uh, Israel's presence. And then in chapter 11, he deals with some of the present as well as the future of the nation of Israel. He's explaining to Jew and Gentile and to all of us today that God has a plan for the nation of Israel. Last week we talked about him giving the illustration of grafting in a wild, uh, a wild uh, tr tree, wild olive tree, into a good tree. There was a good tree growing, and uh, what, it got, what happened here? That good tree got to the point where it had to be a uh, re rebellion, and they cut off and went, what he did, then he grafted in to that, that good tree, the church. And when that, that grafted in, that meant they're still there, and both, both this part and this part can be saved now at this time. But one day, when all of the, all of the Gentiles are saved and they're raptured out, then God is going to deal with the, with the stump again, and that's the nation of Israel. And so, uh, he, since a wild olive tree represents us Gentiles, every true believer is in the tree of divine blessing 
but not everyone is in, in the tree is a believer. That means that we can all be saved by repentance and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now we come down to chapter, uh, to verse 23. And if you will take a notes now, if you'll note there, here God is acting dispensationally in chapter, in verses 23 through 29. Uh, here Paul continues his theme from the present verses by continuing with the same symbolism to show that God is not through with the nation of Israel and that he has every in intention, every intention of completing and completely restoring Israel to all of the previous promises, privileges, and blessings that he promised them in the Old Testament. And he'll show you at the end of this why, why because God cannot change and uh, that his gifts and calling are without repentance. And we'll be explaining that just a little bit later on. And notice how he demonstrates how God is acting dispensationally. If you look at verse 23 and 24, you will note how it is within his power, it's within the power of God to restore Israel. And notice, if you will, in verse 23, and there's three words in there, God is able. So since the grafting in of the Gentiles was supernatural, so the same power, the same supernatural power will restore the nation of Israel. And we in our lifetime, and we have enjoyed uh, observing this in our lifetime, I had no idea uh, the, I guess maybe the first 15 years that was Israel was back in the land, that that was God's prophetic plan until I got in Bible college and began to understand that God had a plan for that nation and that that nation was, would be, we would enjoy the blessings of God one day. And so uh, the same power that brought us in supernaturally into the blessing of God, the Gentiles, uh, the same power is going to bring Israel back. An Old Testament passage that makes it very clear that Israel will turn back and, and find the Lord is found in Zechariah chapter 8, verses 12, and uh, well, uh, chapter 12, verse 10, where the Bible says this, and I will pour out upon the house of David. Now, who is the house of David? If you're reading that and, and generally reading that, who is the house of David? That's the nation of Israel. I will pour upon the house of the nation and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplement, and they shall look upon me whom they have pierced, and they shall, and, and they shall mourn for him as one that mourneth for his own son and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. In other words, there is coming a time when Israel will do, do that. And when is this going to happen? Well, look this way for a moment and we'll tell you. First of all, notice right now, we start right here with the cross, and that's when the Lord Jesus died on the cross. We're living now in the age of the church, and we don't know what time that our Lord is going to come back and we'll be raptured out. When we are raptured out and the saints, are, the saints, both Jews and Gentiles that are, in, that are saved, are in heaven, God is going to start dealing with the nation of Israel again. He's preparing that right now by bringing them back and bringing them back into their country. And that's why they're over there right now. And they're... Millions and millions of people surrounding that small country, but yet they are afraid of them. And they all hate, the, every one of those country around them, hate uh, Israel and would like to destroy them. Now why does all of those people hate Israel? Why is it? Well, number one, the devil hates 
Israel. The devil hates you and me, and he will do everything he can to keep us from being what we ought to be. And the devil will do everything to prove that Israel, uh, that God can, can lie. He's trying to make a liar out of God. And so that's why he leads all of these nations against the nation of Israel. And I believe with all of my heart that one day the whole United States is going to turn against Israel just like the other states and the countries around the world. Amen. Now, they do that because Satan is leading and trying to prove that God is a liar and God cannot lie. So we know who's going to be the winner. However, we do know there's going to be a struggle. And so this is what the Apostle Paul is dealing with at this time. He said, it's going to happen. So God is going to deal with the nation of Israel. Now, the nation of Israel is still, as far as the nation is concerned during the tribulation, still in unbelief as a nation. And all at once, when we get to the end of the tribulation period, the, the nation of Israel is going to realize that they have crucified the Messiah. They have looked upon him that whom they have pierced, according to Zechariah chapter 12, verse 10. And they will mourn, and many of them will turn to them, and uh, hundreds of them, and, and if you'll notice on the next page in the book of Romans, well, it, it tells us that all Israel will be saved. That doesn't mean that all individual Israelites will be saved. It means that the nation of Israel will turn to back to trust the Messiah as their king and as their Lord. And they will turn to God in repentance and God will save that nation and, 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 and he will then save individuals in that nation just like he saves you and me at this time by his marvelous mercy and his grace. And then secondly, I want you to notice that it's not only within the power of God, but it is also, according to verses 25 through 29, that it is in the purpose of God to restore Israel. Now that Paul has shown us that it is within God's power to restore Israel, he now describes the reason or the purpose for that restoration. Note the threefold guarantee that God will do what he says he's going to do. First of all, if you're looking at verse 25 there, you'll note that his purpose includes his constitutional or guarantee. There are two expressions in the New Testament that relate to us Gentiles in our day. The first one is described as the times of the Gentiles. Now the word the times of the Gentiles is mentioned only one time in, it, in the Bible and it's mentioned by our Lord over in Luke 21 verse 20 through 24. The other one mentions in this passage is described as the fullness of the Gentiles. Even though some people believe that they are both uh, synonymous, I believe if you search the scripture, you'll find that there is a difference. And let me share with you that difference. First of all, the times of the Gentiles, mentioned only one time by our Lord, begin in 586 B.C., when the Babylonian, uh, Babylonians conquered Jerusalem and King Nebuchadnezzar's armies breached the city walls and destroyed the temple and the city's palaces and took the tribe of Judah into captivity. The times will continue from that time, 586 B.C., until an unknown date in the future when the Lord Jesus comes to redeem Israel and crush their enemies according to Daniel chapter 2 verse 44. We don't know when that time is going to come because that, that has to do with the rapture. Now, he, that, and when he concludes and that's destroyed, 
all of the armies at the Battle of Armageddon, then the times of the Gentiles will close. All right? So the times of the Gentiles started in 586 B.C. and will run until the end of the tribulation period. Got that? Just remember now, let's talk about the fullness of the Gentiles. The fullness of the Gentiles mentioned by the Apostle Paul began in the, with the crucifixion of Christ and uh, then that, that, that was, the act was sealed by uh, uh, Israel's resisting the Holy Spirit on the day of, Pente of, not, not on the day of Pentecost, but all the way up to chapter 9 in the book of Acts. Increasingly in the book of Acts, the emphasis will become to the Gentiles. And so Peter describes this time in chapter 15 as God as first did visit the Gentiles to take of them a people for his name. So the term fullness of Gentiles is worthy of note. The word comes from the Greek word, which means a filling up or a completion. And during that time from the book of Acts to the date unknown, when the last Gentile will be saved, or Jew, will enter into the fold, as John, Jesus said, described in John 10, the last Gentile, the gates will close, the rapture will take place, and the partial hardening of Israel is going to end at that time. Although there are differences in opinion about the terms, the words of Paul are crystal clear. God has decreed a dispensation in which the Jews are hardened and the blessings of the Jews are, are poured out on the Gentiles and the Gentiles as well as individual Jews who accept the Lord Jesus Christ are having their day of salvation and blessing due to Israel's unbelief and hardening of their hearts. But the day will come that day will come to an end when Israel's day is soon coming. The fullness of the Gentiles refers to a time when the day of Gentiles ends and the restoration of Israel begins. So that takes place at the rapture. So the fullness of the Gentiles started with a direct rejection of Christ all the way to the rapture and then he deals with the Jewish nation again. Now... I want you to notice that. Now, let's go on and look at verse 26. Here, notice how his purpose involves his Christological guarantee. When Paul writes here and he says, and all Israel shall be saved, he does not refer to all every individual Israelite who will be saved, but he is referring to the nation in general with, uh, who will turn to the Lord in faith and obedience. And the Greek word for all in the text before the proper name there means the whole. The term is also used in Matthew chapter 2 verse 3 and also in chapter 3 verse 5. It said that and, and all Israel came out to hear John the Baptist. And uh, not all Israel came out to hear John the Baptist. All the people that could came out to hear John the Baptist. Surely not every person came out to hear him at that time. And then so Paul quotes Isaiah 59 verse 20 from the Old Testament and the message to the individual is that he is that he is that he he will have to turn away ungodliness if you'll notice in that verse meaning a turning from sin and repentance and accepting Jesus Christ by faith and there will be a remnant that will do this very thing at the close of the tribulation uh, 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 and, and, and accept the nation of Israel. And there's always been a remnant that is saved. There was a remnant in Elijah's day. There was a remnant in David's day. There was a remnant in the Apostle Paul's day. There, was a there is a remnant in their day, their day. Not all Gentiles are going to be saved, are they? No, they're not because some of them have already died and and gone to hell, and there will be a remnant during the great tribulation period that will be saved. And, and then I want you to notice verses 27, 28, and 29. Consider how his purpose incorporates 
his contractual guarantee. It's here in these verses that Paul has reference to the new covenant. Now, <coughs> Peter dealt with the new covenant on the day of Pentecost when he preached that great sermon on that day. And so, but it was only partially fulfilled. And according to what the Apostle Paul is referring to here, that the rest of that, uh, that part of the new covenant will be fulfilled. And he is referring back, and if you want to put it in your Bible, you can write above the word covenant or somewhere near uh, the co word covenant in that verse as the new covenant will, will be fulfilled. And it will, it's, a, it's a guarantee that God made with Jeremiah in chapter 31, verse 31. Now, if you look at verse 28, according to the gospel, they, Israel, is considered enemies. In their blindness, in their stubbornness, in their unyieldingness, because of the hardening process, now active in Israel, they are hostile and considered enemies of the gospel. So the hardening process is fulfilling God's purpose in having a gospel preached to the Gentiles. And now look at verse 29. Paul is confirming those covenants. He made, uh, he made with, uh, the, with Abraham in, the, in, in Ur of the Chaldees and continued on through, uh, through his son Isaac and then through Jacob and through the, the, uh, the rest of the nation of Israel. And he said there, that it is without repentance. And the words uh, without repentance means in the Greek about which no change of mind can take place. So the gifts and calling that referring to all of the promises of God to Israel will never be taken back. So in referring to God's promises to Israel, the Apostle Paul has explained both the fairness and the farsightedness of God's dealing with them. Now, well, let's move along because I would like to get through with this today because if you could hang in here with me, and because then I want you to consider the faithfulness of God to the nation of Israel in verses 30 through verse 36. Paul's ex explanation has gone full circle now, and it's showing that Israel showing that Israel's unbelief, they have been parsed because of that, they have been partially and temporarily set aside, and the gospel of salvation has been directed toward the Gentiles, and it's God's grace has been extended to them in their unbelief, how much more surely will he extend his grace again to his chosen people, Israel, while they are in the unbelief. Note how Paul uh, wraps up these ch three chapters, and we quickly move through it. First of all, his faithfulness is revealed in the mercy of his ways. The word mercy there carries with it the idea of loyalty to God's covenant and refers to the basic idea of having compassion for those in need that leads to meeting their need. In these passages, he uses the word mercy four times, and the Greek term as well as the Hebrew is filled with emotion, referring to the fact that God really, really does love the nation of Israel, but he just can, will not and cannot put up with their sin. And so the real application of that, all of that here is that God loves us, and he loves even Christians, he lives out of the unsaved, but he will not put up with sin in our lives. It doesn't make any of what it is. Okay, if it's lack of obedience, you know you ought to be doing something that you ought not to be doing. And you know you ought to do something that, that, uh, that he tells you to do and you're not doing it. That's sin. And he deals with it. And, this, and, this, and in this case, mercy is shown to both Jew and Gentile, as is seen in these verses that follow. First, notice now, first of all, first it is revealed, it is revealed in his mercy toward the Gentiles. Look at verse 30. Here again, the Apostle Paul stresses the fact that 
God's dealings with Israel had been a means of his extending his grace to us. Aren't you glad? And, uh, you say, well, I'm not a Jew. Well, you're not a Jew. But you ought to be glad that his grace has been extended to you through their rebellion. And then verse 31, he, it is reflected in his mercy toward the Jews. Here Paul is drawing a parallel. Once the Gentiles were unbelievers, but through disobedience on the part of the Jews, they have found mercy. Now the Jews are unbelievers, but, but by the mercy of the Gentiles, they too may find mercy. And then thirdly, it, real, it, it is realized in his mercy toward the whole world. Look at verse 32. The thought here is that God has declared both Jew and Gentile in the same category, and that's one kind of what? Guilt. And the word is, and then you underline it in your Bibles, unbelief. Unbelief. That he might have mercy on all. In other words, both Jew and Gentile are all in the state of unbelief that, they might, that he might have mercy upon all, including both Jew and Gentile. Not just one nation, Israel, but not just one group of people, but both the Gentiles and the Jews alike. And so in this dispensation of grace that you and I are living in, the only way for anyone to become a child of God is to recognize their sinful condition and then repent of their sin and trust the Lord Jesus Christ as their only Savior. Today we go out and witness and we try to talk to people. And some people say, well, you have to deal with different people with different people with different people. Uh, here, here's one thing that I, I think is so important. And R.G. Lee said it many, many years ago. The only way you can get anybody saved is to get them lost. When a person begins to realize he is in a state of unbelief, born in a state of unbelief, then you want to do something about it. And so sometimes he's been misled into believing that if he would or turn over a new leaf or work for his salvation or join some church or be baptized or all kinds of things that, that, and, and, and pay his tithes and things like this. Uh, I've had people, oh, unsaved people call, call me and tell me they'd like to give their tithes to the church. And they're lost. And I tell them, first of all, you need to be saved. Then you can do that. Right? Because what if I accepted those tithes? He would think in his mind that giving to the church is going to guarantee him a place in heaven. And so you just know many, many other ways that people think. Some people think you have to speak in tongues. Some others believe you this, that, and the other. You have all kinds of people, all kinds of uh, things that they believe and have been misled. But there's only one way that a person can get out of his unbelief, and that's recognize his lost condition, repent, turn from his sin, and trust the Lord Jesus Christ as the only way of salvation. Amen? Amen. And so that is. And what the Apostle Paul realizes and see, saw in his day is still a worldwide condition spiritually. The whole world is still in sin. And uh, you think about all of the atrocities that take place today. The only thing you can, you can say is the world's at it again. They're just expressing what they are. Lost sinners that need to repent and trust Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. And the whole world is still in sin and unbelief as well as Israel who refuses to accept Jesus as the Messiah. Secondly, I want you to notice in verse 33, <coughs> in verse 30, 33 through 36, his faithfulness is resounded in the majesty of his ways. Here the 11th chapter of the book of Romans closes with a song of praise to the Lord. After reflecting on the unsearchable mercy of God, Paul is prompted by the Holy Spirit to break forth in a doxology. Note the division of the song. Here, his song of praise. First, he, his majestic ways are beyond human determination. 
in verses 33 through 35. You see, man is a, is a great thinker. So Paul, in these two verses, 33, 34, and 35, gives glory to God like stringing pearls on a line. In, in this way, looking at the line, it becomes beyond our imagination. Notice the beauty of the line, which is beyond human determination. Before Paul moves to the application of what we have learned, he stops and for a few brief sentences says in di several different ways, isn't God good? Boy, you think about the mercy of God. Isn't God good? As you think about your own life, and as I think about my own life, I have to come back and say, isn't the mercy of God good? I could be on my way to hell today. But by his mercy and his grace, I have been transformed and now I am a child of the king and I'm looking forward to that day when I'll be taken out of here and be raptured out. Amen. Amen? And so, anyway, he breaks loose. Isn't God good? Look how he does it. First of all, here's how he tells about how God is good. He said, he good when it comes to the mind of God it is unmeasurable. He uses the word depth in that passage there, which means deep water at an extended degree, extremely deep. From the first century and for the first century traveler, nothing would be more powerful and profound than the sea. Its depths were dark and mysterious and defying any uh, to know its secrets. And so he's talking about the depths of the sea. And then not only notice, if you will, notice also the word riches in this passage, which means wealth related to much in number and quality and kinds. And so the basic sense is spilling over with goodness. The wealth can be physical, the wealth can be spiritual, the wealth can be moral, and of course the reference is here is to all three of them, every one of them. And then consider the phrase, he hath wisdom and knowledge. Now think about that. Think about me, the word wisdom meaning a healthy dose of perspective and the ability to make sound judgments about a subject. Well, the word knowledge has to do with understanding by personal experience. Both represent the sum total of all there is to think. They speak of God's knowledge of all things and his ability to perfectly order all events. And boys, if you think about that, amen. Especially in a day when you look at and watch television or watch the news on television, there is no good news on television. It's all bad because one political group is telling the, the, how bad that other political group is and this political group on this side that, that people, these people thought that was so bad are saying all the bad things about that side. And that you get to the point where you don't know who to believe. Amen. i tell you who you can believe. Here's a book that has 66 books in it. You can believe every one of them. All the way from Genesis to maps. Amen. You can believe every word of it. So stick to the book. Stick to the book because it shares with us about his, his divine wisdom and uh, knowledge. And God knows everything there is to know perfectly. I, I think about this when I, and I insert it and I didn't, I just thought about it. I thought about uh, the days when uh, that Dr. Adrian Rogers was the pastor over in in Florida. It was close to uh, Cape Canaveral. And one of the astronauts, or one of the men that worked at, at the Space Center, his wife attended Brother uh, Rogers' church there. Brother Rogers was a young man then. And, and so he kept, um, his wife kept telling Brother Rogers, please pray for my uh, husband. He, he's an atheist. And uh, he said, uh, 
he, he's, uh, he really is, and he needs, needs the Lord. Well, time went on, and of course, uh, being married to an unsafe person brings on problems, uh, as the Bible teaches. And so, uh, they begin to have trouble. Now, the man didn't want his marriage to dissolve, but she gave him an ultimatum. She said, you're going to have to go and talk to Brother Rogers. And if you don't go talk to him, we're going we're gonna to proceed with the divorce. So he, Roger said he kind of fished, got out of it for about a couple of weeks and it just kept waiting. Finally, he called and asked for an appointment. He said he would come by and see him. And he got walked in and he sat down and he said, yes, sir, uh, Dr. Rogers commented about his, his uh, wonderful wife and everything. And he said, um, he said, uh, they tell me uh, you're an atheist. He said, yeah. Yeah, uh, he said, uh, uh, "Does do you know what an atheist is?" And he said, "Well, yeah." I, uh, but he said, "An atheist is a person that knows there is no God." And he said, "Let me ask you something. Do you know all there is to know about everything?" <laughs> he said, "No." He said, "Well, let me ask you this. Would you say?" that you know 80% of all there is to know about everything. And he said, no, sir. He said 50. Then he went down to 40, 20, 10, 5, 4, 3, 2. He got down to about 1%. He said, does that mean you know 1% about everything? He said, yes, I, I could say I know 1% of everything there is to know about everything. He said, did you ever think for a moment that in the 99% you don't know that God exists? God was shocked. And did you know something? That God loves you and God sent his son to die for atheists and all kinds of people. And then Brother Rogers proceeded to win this man to Christ. He said sometime later, he, of course he went to Memphis to pastor, and this man was transferred to, over to Huntsville, Alabama, and became a, an exciting church member. Later on, was became a deacon in the church and, and retired somewhere in Massachusetts, and he said, and still living for the Lord. God is the only person that knows everything about everything. Amen. And then secondly, when it comes to the decision of God and his decisions, they are unsearchable. We have here the word unsearchable, which means impossible to fully investigate. No matter how great the effort, going beyond all human ability to even locate. And then thirdly, when it comes to the ways of God, they are untraceable. Notice the phrase, his ways are past finding out. It carries with it the idea of hunting down an animal by following his trail with no success. Then if you look at verse 34, the Apostle Paul quotes two Old Testament passages. First he quotes Isaiah chapter 40 verse 13 when he writes, For who hath known the mind of God, or who hath been his counselor? The verb hath, hath known in the Greek is so constructed as to make it timely. So Paul's full meaning is this. Whoever knew or who knows now or who will ever know the man, the man of God. The inescapable answer is no one can know the mind of God. Can the human mind ever fathom the mind of God? And then the second part of the question is, or who hath been his counselor? Who's told God what to do? This is the only time the word is used in the New Testament and it means one who advises. So the question is, with whom took he counsel and who instructed God? Who taught him in the, uh, in the path of judgment and taught him knowledge and showed to him the way of understanding? Isaiah chapter 40 says, 
Absolutely no one. No one. Secondly, he quotes Job 41, verse 11, which is a rendition of God's word to Job in which the apostle expand, expands upon the splendor of God. Everything man possesses and has been given to him by the Lord God of heaven, and however mankind refuses to acknowledge this, the believer, on the other hand, will never be able to thank the Lord enough for his bountiful love and the gifts God bestows upon the ones that he does love. He'll never be able to. Then secondly, his majestic ways are beyond human defenses. Notice verse 36. Having completed all thought and having considered all explanation relating to the topic of God, uh, God's plan for the Jews, Paul ends with the beginning. For of him, meaning that God is the source of all things, and through him, meaning that sustain, God sustains all things and gives everything purpose and movement, and to him, something God is the sense, meaning that God is a scheme or purpose for which all things exist. All things? You think about that. That would include your current situation. That would include what you cannot figure out. That would include the blessings of your family. That would include the loss of your precious loved one. You don't understand it, do you? I, you think about some family, your family member that died suddenly or something happened that took them away. Uh, my mother almost grieved herself to death over the death, sudden death, of her 22-year-old son who drowned along with his wife for many, many days. But God only knows. And today, I don't understand why God took that young couple that day on May 15, 1949. I don't understand why mom, my mother died at her age 66 and she didn't live to be 86. I don't understand that. I don't understand why God allowed my son to be born with a heart defect which would lead some one day to his death and he's dead now and in heaven. I don't understand that. Well, I don't understand it all. And we may not ever understand it even in eternity future. Why? Because his ways are past founding out. And it's, fine. It's, it's important that you and I get under his direction and let him lead us and guide us. And then the Apostle Paul ends it by saying, In him be glory until I get mad. No, it says, In him be glory forever. That is the inspired apostle's conclusion and his a comment that ends the 11th chapter of this very, very significant epistle. After answering the question that deals with man's sin, God's salvation, and now dealing with Israel's situation, Paul ends with something that we can keep for life. This simple di doxology draws a clear distinction between the doctrinal section and the duty section that's coming in Romans chapter 12. So he's been dealing with doctrine, and now in the future he's going to be dealing with duty. Boy, we covered a lot of ground today, didn't we? But here's a, here's, a, here's, a here's a clincher. God loves Israel, and he has a plan for them. God loves you, and he has a plan for you too. All you have to do is allow him to do so. May God help you to do so. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed.